a 41-year-old male with lupus nephritis and chronic renal insufficiency maintained on prednisone and candesartan presents for a routine clinic visit. Uh, BP 146 over 95, moderate edema, her K is 6.3, bicarb 18, creatinine 1.6. Which of the following would not be appropriate in the management of this patient? Hydrochlorothiazide, DC candesartan, fludrocortisone, low potassium diet, sodium polystyrene sulfonate, which is kx -alate. Okay, so I would agree with the majority of you that fludrocortisone is the one that's probably least appropriate. So why does this patient have hyperkalemia? Uh, I can identify at least three different causes. One is obviously that the patient has some degree of renal insufficiency. Secondly, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers cause hyperkalemia. Um, thirdly, the patient may not be on a low potassium diet. And then fourthly, um, in this setting of having lupus nephritis, mild renal insufficiency, it's not uncommon to develop hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism. Uh, lupus nephritis is one of the causes of hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism. So the treatment could include a low potassium diet or even binding gut potassium with K-exalate. Um, it could include stopping the, the ARB, and it could include trying to increase renal case uh, excretion with thiazide diuretic, or if the GFR is low enough, a loop diuretic, which is the usual treatment for hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism. Now, one might think that giving fludrocortisone would be a very direct way of fixing a patient with hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism, and indeed doing so does bring down the serum potassium, but at the expense of worsening the hypertension and worsening the edema. And so we don't usually treat hyporenemic hypoaldo with fludrocortisone. So in this sort of patient, uh, I would probably avoid it. A 26-year-old male with AIDS is admitted with pneumocystis pneumonia and treated with prednisone and IV trimethoprim sulfur. On exam, he's tachypneic, diffuse rals, EKG appears normal, his K is 5.9. Um, and the question is, which is the best treatment for the hyperkalemia? Is it fludrocortisone? sodium bicarbonate, DC the trimethoprim sulfur and start pentamidine, DC trimethoprim sulfur and start atovaquone, or none of the above. Okay, so most of you chose C or D, recognizing that trimethoprim in trimethoprim sulfur or Bactrim is a weak uh, organic cation that mimics a milleride and triamterin, thereby inhibiting the epithelial sodium channel ENAC in the collecting duct and causing hyperkalemia. So you have to stop the trimethoprim. The only problem is that pentamidine, which we also use for treating pneumocystis, does the same thing. So swapping trimethoprim sulfur from pentamidine wouldn't help. You have to swap it and exchange it for something else. Uh, and atovaquone is a reasonable choice. So D is the correct answer here. So next case, a 57-year-old female of end-stage renal disease secondary to diabetic nephropathy maintained in chronic hemodialysis is seen on the non-dialysis day, at which point her serum potassium is 7.1. And these are the rest of the electrolytes. All of the following would lower the serum potassium substantially except insulin glucose, sodium bicarbonate, albuterol, sodium polystyrene sulfonate, hemodialysis. Okay, good. So all of you recognize that um, sodium bicarbonate has not been shown to be effective at lowering potassium levels in dialysis patients. In non-dialysis patients, uh, if they're quite acidotic and they have hyperkalemia, it's reasonable to add bicarb to any other treatment you're giving, like insulin uh, or albuterol. But in dialysis patients, it's pretty much useless. Okay, a 23-year-old male with diabetes mellitus presents with five days of polyuria, polydipsia, and abdominal pain. His K is 6.5. 
My carb is 15, BUN is 38, creatinine 1.6. Your analysis shows 1.028 specific gravity, pH 4.5, 1 plus protein, 2 plus ketones. Which of the following statements about the total body stores in this patient is most likely to be correct? Total body K depleted, total body K overloaded, normal total body potassium stores, total body sodium depleted, normal potassium stores, total body sodium overloaded, or none of the above. Okay, so most of you picked the correct answer, which is A. Some of you picked C. Okay, so most of you recognize that even though the serum potassium is elevated, this patient of DKA is clearly not total body potassium overloaded. The thing to remember here is that the thing to remember here is that not only is potassium in this setting shifted from the intracellular pool to the extracellular pool, but the extra potassium in the extracellular pool is also being excreted in the urine because this is a patient that has an osmotic diuresis from the hyperglycemia. So patients with uh, diabetic polyuria lose large amounts of potassium. So in fact, even though the serum potassium is elevated, this patient is total body potassium depleted. And this manifests itself because when you correct the serum glucose by giving this patient insulin, the serum potassium does not return to normal. It drops below normal. And so the um, clinical experience is that when these patients are treated with insulin at a certain point, they need to be replaced with potassium to replace that lost potassium. And so A is in fact the correct answer. A 47-year-old -year man with type 2 diabetes mellitus is seen for routine follow-up for CKD, thought to be due to diabetic nephropathy. Um, he's on a whole bunch of meds, and his sodium is 156, K of 5.1, uh, serum creatinine is 1.9, calcium is 11.6, and phosphate is 4.1. And the question is, I'll leave that up for you, which of the following is the most likely cause of the hyponatremia in this patient? Um, is it the hydrochlorothiazide, losartan, vitamin D, osmotic diuresis from glucose, or surreptitious laxative abuse? Okay, so you guys didn't fall for the trick. So C, vitamin D is correct. So this is a patient who is hyponatremic, most likely because of hypercalcemia. So remember that hypercalcemia is one of the two electrolyte disorders that causes a renal concentrating defect. In other words, it causes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The other one is, of course, hypokalemia. And that's why one of the major presentations of hypercalcemia is, of course, polyuria. So in the setting of hypercalcemia, there is loss of free water and that leads secondarily to hypernatremia. In this patient, the most likely contributing factors for the hypercalcemia are the treatment with calcium acetate and the vitamin D. D. And so stopping the vitamin D and perhaps even the calcium acetate would probably correct serum calcium and correct the serum sodium in this patient. Our next case is a 34-year-old male with alcoholic cirrhosis, hepatic encephalopathy, uh, variceal bleeding, he's banded, maintained NPO and treated with propanolol, triotide, lactulose and half normal saline. And his serum sodium is also unexpectedly elevated at 151. Uh, Urinosmolasis is 855. And the question is, um, which of the following would be the best treatment to prevent worsening hyponatremia? which is this to say, again, what's the problem of causing the hyponatremia? Should you reduce the lactulose, reduce the triotide, change to 5% dextrose, start hydrochlorothiazide, or start the meclocycline? And a um, little bit of difference of opinion. Um, 
the most likely reason for the hyponatremia. So this is hyponatremia associated with a high urinosm. So this has to be extra renal water loss. So where's their extra renal water loss? There shouldn't be a lot of insensible losses. So it's got to be the GI tract. So in osmotic diarrhea, which means diarrhea caused because of an osmotically active agent that's in the lumen of the gut and pulls water in with it, you get loss of free water in the diarrhea. Okay? And so lactulose is a very good example of an osmotic diarrhea. Uh, so is, for example, go lightly, which is polyethylene glycol. So lactulose causes an osmotic diarrhea and causes hyponatremia. There's almost certainly the cause here. So um, the treatment here is to cut back lactulose because obviously they're giving him too much and he's getting too much diarrhea. Now triatide I don't think has a major effect on serum sodium. Uh, changing fluids to 5% dextrose is reasonable, but it doesn't um, address the underlying cause. Maybe at the end you can, we'll take questions, because I've got to get through, I think, about seven or eight more questions in six minutes. 66-year-old female with non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus uh, presents with several days of lethargy, polyuria, decreased oral intake. She's tachycardic, she looks dry. Her serum potassium is 5.4, bicarb is 25, BUN creatinine are 42 over 1.8, serum glucose is 975. After initiation, sorry, after initial resuscitation of insulin and isotonic saline, which of the following treatments would be appropriate? Hypotonic saline, oral fluid restriction, hypotonic saline, solvat, and or furosemide. Okay, and C, most of you chose hypotonic saline, which is indeed correct. So the trick here is to recognize that the patient has very mild hyponatremia, but the cause of the hyponatremia is almost certainly because of hyperglycemia. And so we need to correct serum sodium, meaning we have to ask the question, what do we expect the serum sodium to be once we've corrected the serum glucose? And hopefully I gave you the formula here, which is that for every 100 mg per decimal increase in glucose, we have to add 1.6 to the serum sodium. So here with a glucose of almost 1,000, we would have to add 9 times 1.6, which is about 14. When we add that to 134, it's about 148. So the corrected serum sodium is hyper, hypernatremic, and the appropriate response is to give this patient hypotonic fluid as well. And that's why C is correct. Uh, next question, 74-year-old female, hypertension and hyperlipidemia, is admitted with an unsteady gait and a fall at home. Uh, she's on the thiazide, lisinopril, simvastatin, and aspirin. She appears euvolemic. Serum sodium is 117. Uh, triglycerides are 345. Uh, urine sodium is 38, urinosmolality is 230, T4 is a little low at 0.5, serum cortisol is normal. So the question is, which is the most likely cause of her hyponatremia? Pseudohyponatremia, adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, SIADH, or adverse effects of medications? And the answer is almost certainly adverse effect medications, and the specific medication is, of course, hydrochlorothiazide, a very common cause of hyponatremia, particularly in females and particularly in the elderly. And um, um, so there's no suspicion of adrenal insufficiency. Uh, there's no real suspicion of pseudohyponatremia. Yes, the triglycerides are a little elevated, but they're not super elevated. It could be really very high, like over a thousand before you'd even suspect pseudohyponatremia. Uh, patient's clearly not hypothyroid. Uh, could be SIADH, of course, um, but um, thiazides are just much more common in this situation. A uh, 48-year-old female with small cell lung cancer has been noted to have a low serum sodium for three months, presents with nausea, inability to tolerate oral fluids, it's mildly hypovolemic, and her serum sodium is 108, urinosmolality 800, 
and by the way, she's alert and oriented. She started on hypertonic saline at 200 mils per hour. Five hours later, her serum sodium is 122. Her mental status is unchanged. And the question is, which of the following would be the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? Hypertonic saline continued at a slightly lower rate. Stop the fluids and now switch to Tolvactam. Swap fluids and initiate a liter of daily oral fluid restriction. 5% dextrose at 150 mils per hour for two hours or none of the above. Okay, good. So majority of you actually uh, chose the 5% dextrose. So the issue here is this is chronic asymptomatic hyponatremia, probably due to SIADH, and this needs to be, sodium needs to be brought up slowly. Here the sodium was brought up by 14 mil equivalents in five hours, which is much too fast. And so this patient uh, is at risk of developing osmotic demyelination syndrome, which can take several days to manifest. Um, there's increasing evidence to suggest that bringing the sodium back down acutely uh, can help to prevent that from happening. And so the appropriate treatment is to give the patient back now some 5% dextrose to bring the sodium down to the, the correct level for uh, an increase of about half a milliquim per liter per hour. So D is the correct answer here. Yeah. A uh, 25-year-old male is evaluated because of elevated blood pressure and routine exam. He has his blood pressure. He's got hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. Renin is 0.2. Aldo is 2.5. Cortisol levels are normal. Free cortisol to cortisone ratio in the urine is also normal. Which of the following would be most effective at lowering the blood pressure in this patient? Amiloride and spironolactone, amiloride but not spironolactone, phenoxybenzamine, renal artery angioplasty, or adrenalectomy. Okay, and good. So most of you chose B, which is the correct answer. So this is a patient who has hyperaldosteronism, renins and aldos are low, therefore the differential is Cushing's, Liddell's, syndrome of apparent mineral corticoid excess or licorice. Syndrome of apparent mineral corticoid excess and licorice are excluded because the free cortisol to cortisone ratio in the urine is normal. Cushing's is excluded because the 24-hour urine cortisol is normal. So most likely this patient has littles, a condition of overactivity of the ENAC. The treatment is the block ENAC with a milleride. Spironolactone acts on the mineral corticoid receptor, which is upstream of ENAC. Therefore, spironolactone would not correct the hypertension or the hypokalemia. And so amiloride works, not spironolactone. And that's why B is correct and not A. A 17-year-old male with symmetrical thigh weakness, um, and in his case 2.8. 24-hour urine shows that the urine potassium is 40 and the urine chloride is 55. What's the most likely diagnosis? Is it Kittleman's, familial hypokalemic periodic paralysis, hyperthyroidism, bulimia, or adrenal adenoma? Good. So most of you chose Gittleman's, which is correct. So this is renal K-wasting without hypertension. Uh, the clue here is that urine chloride is very high. So unless this patient is abusing diuretics, uh, he's got to have Gittleman's, and diuretics wasn't listed as a cause here. So A is the best uh, answer here. And I think this is the last case, 48-year-old female uh, who's thin, tanned, has a blood pressure of 90 over 45, K of 6.1, and um, yes, sodium of 131, glucose of 40. Which of the following tests would be most likely to establish the diagnosis in this patient? blood pressure is low too. Renin and aldo, cortisol at baseline after ACTH, serum C-peptide, iothalamate GFR determination, and genetic testing of the sodium channel gene. And most of you chose cortisol, so this sounds like a patient of adrenal insufficiency. I agree there are a number of other possibilities here, uh, but the only one that fits with the answers is testing for cortisol levels to elicit the patients with Addison's. Um, 
which is indeed the correct diagnosis. 65-year-old, uh, diabetes, hypertension, ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, on these meds, and EKG shows bradycardia, peak T waves, and widened QRS complexes in the setting of a serum potassium of 5.9, uh, which is the most appropriate initial treatment. Is it calcium chloride, hydrocortisone, hemodialysis, ditch fab fragments, or none of the above? Good. So almost all of you chose calcium, which is the appropriate treatment when their EKG changes to stabilize the cardiac membrane. Um, and by the way, ditch toxicity causing hyperkalemia is uh, quite rare unless they're very, very severely ditch toxic, uh, in which case, of course, fab fragments are indicated, but they wouldn't be the initial, first initial therapy here. Uh, I forgot to mention that actually in the setting of ditch toxicity, giving calcium can actually worsen it. So that's well recognized that um, increasing intracellular calcium in the heart in the setting of ditch toxicity can worsen it. So that's the reason that if you have a strong suspicion of ditch toxicity, then you want to avoid giving IV calcium. So I apologize. So in fact, A is probably not the best uh, treatment unless you're sure the patient's ditch levels are not very high. Uh, and so um, Digibind is a reasonable treatment. Uh, obviously, you would want to give other, other treatments to bring down the serum potassium at the same time. And lastly, God, a long question for the last one. Okay, 48-year-old male with hypertension and end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis for four years, undergoes a cadaveric renal transplantation, has these immunosuppression, post-op patient remains oliguric, and serum K rises to 6.5. He gets treated with Kexler and Sorbitol, and 12 hours later, complains of diffuse abdominal pain, abdomen is distended and tympanitic with hypoactive bowel sounds. What is the most likely cause of abdominal pain in this patient? Is it ileus due to hypokalemia, stress-induced gastric ulceration, a side effect of the mycophenolate, adrenal insufficiency, or colonic necrosis? one of these, you either know it or you don't. And obviously all of you recognize that KX like can cause colonic necrosis, uh, particularly in post-op patients, the elderly and those who are vascular pass, and a dev dev devastating uh, consequence. Um, okay, uh, I think that's it. Thank you and thanks for playing.